Hello, I'm Tony Guida, and this is my New York. I want to show you a cartoon from Harper's Magazine. A Stone Age family gathered outside their cave, warming their hands, but Mom is dubious. She is asking Dad, are you sure this is fire? Brilliant, incisive, very funny. And you're going to meet the Brooklyn kid who created it next. That cartoon of the Stone Age family is such a favorite of mine, it hangs on a wall in my office, and I consider myself lucky that its creator is a good friend. Welcome, Mort Gerber. Hi, Tony. Good nice to see, to see you. you. To see when you. did you draw that cartoon? Ooh, when did I draw that cartoon? Uh, I, would, I would guess that that was probably uh, 63, 1963. Not 1863, 19... Right, well, 19- we know you've been... Cartooning well, since the Taft administration. Didn't yes, you? actually, we got a dis. It was really Lincoln. That was uh, it was Harper's because I was beginning, just about beginning my career, and uh, that was sort of like those days. It was it was minor leagues. You started with a small magazine, and then you went to bigger magazine. Harper's and the, was probably the pinnacle. Was the of course the New Yorker. Absolutely, but that was Harper's was kind of in the middle, and at that t- time it was. Uh, it was probably the best magazine that I had been, uh, because it was intellectual, smart. And then later on came the other one, Saturday Review, Saturday Post, the Play- Playboy, and then mm, you know, eventually. The big time. The big well, it, it, what was the inspiration for that, for that cartoon? Oh, it's hard to know uh, what the inspiration of any cartoon is, but most of the time it's something... Something bugs me one way or another, and and the way I react to it is is kind of making fun of it, and uh, that's such a great cliche in in just generally, you know, cavemen and and of course the stone, the, you know, the wheel, and and it's always turning it around. That's what cartoonists do. They they have their heads wired weirdly. So you look at something that's normal, and then you look at it from a different way. Well, that was a little bit different. You had these two great I, I've always thought it was a sly uh, commentary by you that uh, even back in the Stone Age, women were smarter. Well, my wife would think so. Judith is very smart. She, she always uh, checks off on everything I've done. She tells me whether it's funny or not, but... Uh, in those days, uh, she wasn't around, so I, I, I don't know. I think I got to know that women were smarter when she was getting involved in, um, in women's liberation, and then I did a whole stuff on women's lib. Yeah. But it could have been. Well, as we're looking at a single, that cartoon, a single panel cartoon, right. and we're going to look at a lot more during the course of this show, it occurs to me that in a single panel cartoon, a lot is going on besides what we see. I mean, the obvious uh, situation and, and perhaps the joke and the humor. But a lot is going on that is that is revelatory of various talents of the cartoonist. Oh, yeah. Well, I, wrote, I write about that in uh, this book that I did. But the fact that a cartoon is, in fact, a combination of exactly what you said, because the cartoonist is the writer. He is uh, the actor because he's, you know, portraying the motions. Right. He speaks dialogue. He sets things up. Uh, he's a multiple talent person. And uh, in well, fact, you're the producer, producer, director, actor. Right. Actually, I once did a cartoon in Playboy that had this long line of, you know, the, the, the director's chair usually says actor and he usually says producer. This is guy had a big line. <laughs> Every one of those things was sitting on it. Uh, producer, director, hyphenate. He was a hyphenate. Right, right. But uh, yes, and uh, many of the other things that cartoonists do are in fact outgrowths, uh, further developments of those very things that you talk about. So you have to be, you know, it, it's just evolving. So children's book writers and novelists and playwrights, they all stem from doing this one, one box. I mean, you know, like Jules Pfeiffer, he's done everything in the world, but actually, he was never able to do a single panel cartoon. Uh, we talked about that once. Not able because he, he was, just didn't 
he, he, didn't, he didn't feel that, that that wasn't his way of expressing himself? Well, he didn't feel comfortable in compressing everything in one in one panel. Yeah, his were mostly like, as I recall, six. Well, you he know, did a the, lot of things. In the you know, voice, the village the, voice. Yeah. Well, in fact, the single panel cartoon, uh, from my uh, visualization of it, is it's a freeze frame. If you think about a movie that goes on. Right. So I think of a situation that goes on. Da 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 And then this guy says this. So it's right at that moment. And you've got to pick or create that one single frame that actually infers everything that went before it and then sometimes anything that will go after it. Mm -hmm. So the trick is to really create that one panel and uh, Jules was never comfortable in that but he's comfortable in a lot of other stuff. Yeah, he he sure is. You're from Brooklyn. Your father was a a cutter in the garment trade. How does his son decide I'm going to be a cartoonist? Where does that come from? No, oh, I never decided. That's that's the whole thing. Uh, I never, I never knew what I was going to be when I grow up. Actually, I still don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up. None it, of us do. No, we were trying it out. We were just trying things. Okay, I mean there was a gene. My father's father was uh, an artist. He was a painter. He mm-hmm. designed things and he designed the stained glass windows in the Flatbush Jewish Center. I mean, he was a hurried guy and he painted. He painted a lot of stuff. So I might have inherited a drawing gene in that, in okay. that sense. I mean, and I then never, the humor is what? I don't. Humor is probably from my mother's side of the family. They were funny. You know, <laughs> my father's side screamed a lot. You know, there was I loudness. He, loudness it was. Loudness. Not funny. I... Lo- I I imagine there was loudness when you said, Dad, I'm going to, uh, you know, be a cartoon, or I'm going to go draw or uh, whatever. There was loudness. No, it was silence. It uh. was silent. I had had a job. I was working in advertising sales promotion. I was working for Cosmopolitan, Ziff Davis, and everything else. I was making a lot of money. I mean, relative to what my father had made, which was never more than $45 a week or whatever. And a number of things went on, and I got to the point I couldn't do this anymore. I couldn't do this writing and things I couldn't care about. And I made a decision after things to quit the job. And I was going to, I had $500 and uh, a car. And mm. I said, I'm leaving this, and I'm going to go to Mexico, and I'm going to live on a hill. I'm going to teach myself to draw. Cause Why I never, Mexico? Because it was cheap. You know, I figured <laughs> I could stay there for a year. And I came home. I was still living at home. And I came home from work and I said, Dad, I've got something to tell you. What? He said. I said, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to Mexico and I'm going to live on a hill and teach myself to draw and maybe become a cartoonist. And, and that he was, said, schmuck. No, he said, <laughs> silence. He looked at me like that and he said, you're disinherited. <laughs> Which was really, uh, first of all, it was a terrible, a shanda, a terrible thing. But right. then it was ridiculous because he didn't have anything from which to disinherit me, as it right. were. Yeah. But that was, uh, that was what, not, so, not, not loudness, it was silence. Silence and shock. I imagine, he, I, I imagine he didn't understand. No. I, I mean, I remember my parents uh, sending this young man off to college to be a doctor. That's what they hoped I would be, a doctor. could have been a doctor. I could have been a doctor. And I very quickly wind up in radio, I mean, as a, I mean, part-time as a college student. And the day I graduate, I have to rush them through graduation because I'm doing three to seven on the radio in oh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Funny. Good. And they're sitting in a studio, and I'm playing records and talking into this thing, and they had... And I think they were thinking, what did we spend all this money on, on college? Well, you, know? you see, I had it. That was a, a, a kind of a fallback. I went to CCNY, City College. Right. And the reason I went there was because that was the only way I was going to get a college education because it was tuition free. There was no money. But the big joke was that they told me I should take a business course. So, so me, as a, I got a BBA, a Bachelor of Business Administration, mm. which is the funniest thing I ever did in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> All I did, basically, at City College was to draw cartoons for the Scottish paper, and that got me that kind of bug. I want to ask you something. I mean, at the time that you make this life-changing decision and you're, you know, you're going to do this thing, you're going to go off, you're going to be... You know, it's the beginning of the process. Right. But I'm wondering, now looking back, what kind of a person 
chooses a career that's like 90% rejection. A crazy person. I mean, it, it is that, right? Well, it's, no, no, no. It's not. That's the whole thing. You used the wrong verb. Or actually, the antecedent. I do that a lot. I, whatever whatever the, 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 the grammar is. I did not choose cartooning. It, cartooning chose me. Okay. It's like I, I didn't have anything to, to say about it. I mean, I'd always been drawing. I'd always been drawing. But I'd always been told, a Jewish boy, this, listen, what, are you joking? You can't, no, nobody makes a living from that. And so it was always, don't do that. You can't do that. Be a lawyer, be a doctor, mm -hmm. you know, be a Tony Guider, somebody like that. <laughs> but nothing fit. And so it always came back. And I remember when I was doing the cartooning book and interviewing all these great, really great cartoonists, and I remember interviewing Misha Richter, who was a wonderful, wonderful artist and a mm. cartoonist, and I said, people ask, maybe come to you and they ask you, you know, because you're a, a mensch, you're a person of a master, did they ask you if they should be cartoonists? He says, yes. And I said, what do you say? And he says, I say to them, if you have to ask, you shouldn't be. Mm. And I think that's, that's the kind of a thing, because people who do this, uh, and these are all my, my wonderful colleagues, really say the same thing. They do it anyway. I mean, a couple of years ago, I, I edited a book called Last Laughs, cartoons about aging, retirement, and the great beyond. I mean, and all these wonderful people came and did this. And one of the bottom line things is it that we would never retire. There's no such thing as retirement, because how can you retire from a job? It's not a job, it's something that we do, and you do it even though you don't want to do it. You're doing it. So it becomes play or it becomes an enjoyment. And that's, I guess, the greatest blessing. That's, that's You've around. done a number of books, uh, and I've got your, your cartooning um, guide, uh, The Art and the Business of Cartooning. And on the front, cartooning, I don't know... Cartooning, The Art and the Business. <laughs> oh, The Art and the Business, yeah. yes. On the front, there is this blurb, wonderful, practical, and honest, and it goes on, from someone named Charles Schultz. Sparky, now, yeah. Do we know if, I mean... Did he know much about cartooning? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, sure. He's a terrific I mean, he, guy. Yeah, he's... Well, he was, he was really, uh, you know, everything that everyone uh, said about him. Enormously talented. He created, you know, all of those great uh, characters, Snoopy, Charlie Brown, and the rest. Right. I, I guess what I'm saying in a roundabout and left-handed way is to have a blurb from Charles Schultz on the front of your book is... Well, I think Pfeiffer you, is you, also that. Yeah, Pfeiffer, but who cares? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but it's, yes, it was, uh, I was very honored uh, uh, that he, he saw that. And actually, I was just astounded uh, when I, I met him because um, I had been started to do a comic strip for the Chicago Tribune Syndicate. And uh, that uh, enabled me to become part of the National Cartoonist Society. So they brought me into this first mm -hmm. dinner, and they, I'm looking around, and, say, and I suddenly see Schultz over there, whom I had never met. And by this time, he was making $9 million a day, you know, and everybody in the world knew from everything that he was doing. I mean, he was just absolutely the biggest and biggest. And so uh, one of the guys from the syndicate said, have you never met him? I said, no. He said, well, come on, Ward, I'll introduce you to, to uh, Sparky. 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 Right. And so they bring me over there to the uh, food table where we were getting food. And they said, Sparky, this is Mort Gerberg. And he, and he said, Mort Gerberg? I think I had by that time maybe sold about 10 or 12 cartoons to the New Yorker. But this to him was this big thing because he said, Mort Gerberg, oh my God, your work is so wonderful. I admire you so much. I said, what? You're and was Peanuts already oh. a huge success? Oh, at of this course. Point? Yeah, you yes. said he's making them. A All of this, I couldn't get over it. And I thought, well, this guy is, you know, jerking my chain a little bit or something. But no, he was the uh, sweetest, sweetest. Sweet man. He yeah. absolutely did mean all those things that he said and I, I couldn't get over it I was just stunned here is this biggest name in, in, in cartooning and the fact that he said it even yeah he did he called out a couple of cartoons that he had seen couldn't believe it good for you no sir but let's look at some of your work your your uh, New Yorker work um, this was inspired by uh, the, the the 2000 election oh right? absolutely well 
I always liked to do stuff that was social commentary and spun off the news, if, if you may remember, news of the views or the whatever, whatever. So I always was looking at the paper. And this was something that I got this idea on the train. See, every, the ritual was that every Tuesday, all the cartoonists come and they would go to the magazine right. and they would get their a basic uh, weekly humiliation, you know, you get, you know, you get everything rejected. And on the train going down, I was thinking, I got to do this, something about the Supreme Court, the, Zoom, the recount screen, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get this? And on the train, going down to the, uh, to the magazine, I got the idea. And I did this quick sketch, and I brought it in, and immediately, you know, they bought it, and it was like an A-issue thing, which means that they were going to go immediately. I can remember the, the, the copy of the magazine arriving that week and turning to whatever page, and there is this thing, and it's just perfect commentary on what well, had happened between Gore and, and Bush and Florida and all of that it stuff. It was, yeah, I, it was one of my most self-satisfying cartoons that I ever ever did because of the immediacy of it. Let's look, you know, there's another one I love, and, and I just... This is, uh... <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, this came... This, I think, was also inspired by one of those uh, uh, interminable presidential political uh, uh, campaign uh, atmospheres, and that's all it was, was spin. This was spin, that was spin, this was spin. So that was a word... Uh, that was uh, something to play with. And uh, I also love the drawing of this. You know, if your career isn't, isn't going um, the way you uh, hoped it would, maybe you just change Oh, no, your, that, was, that was the, uh, the two guys. Redefine success. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. say if at first you don't succeed, redefine success. Well, this is uh, kind of been a light motif uh, for myself in terms of, continuing to do different kinds of things. I mean, I was thought to do, you know, uh, the single panel cartoons, and then when that faded, I would do the spreads, and then I would do reportage, and then I got into the books, and then the children's books. So in each of these, for the moment, it was like not success. So I redefine it, if you will. You know, yeah. I'm not saying that, and then try something else. But I think it's, uh, a, a, maybe it's a, a way of keeping going. I don't know. You got to keep changing yeah. your act. Well, sure. You, it, it, you have to be. You have to adjust. We're all in second. Make act. adjustments, as they say in the baseball world. If the pitcher's getting you out low and away, you don't swing at that pitch anymore. Well, but, that's uh, that's what happens with with times. All of the today, uh, all of the magazines. You know, many of them have disappeared. Uh, cartoonists used to work in hundreds of magazines. I, I used to, like, 70 magazines I would sell to. Now there's, you know, one or two. That's right. it. Put up the next one. Oh. <laughs> Couple of performing seals, and I think you can read the caption, but in case not, of course, what I'd really like to do is direct. Well, this, I think, was the third cartoon I ever uh, sold that appeared uh, for The New Yorker. And I think it's also kind of a light motif. Uh, my wife and the rest of my family tells me I'm very controlling. So <laughs> the idea not of you. not no, me, not no, you. I'm too small. One more, one more. This is, uh, yeah, gee, evolution is slow. <laughs> yes, uh, the other thing is impatience on my part. <laughs> so... All of this stuff comes out. It's all, it's such a, a personal uh, cartoon, uh, art form, uh, more so, I think, than, uh, than anything else, because uh, you're just getting rid of all of your stuff, and yeah. this is a very safe way to do it. Uh, I think it was uh, somebody, I forgot who it was that I was uh, writing about, but a political cartoonist of whom it was said, had he not become a political cartoonist, he would have been an assassin. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. that's... sure. I've seen assassinations on the page, and it's a beautiful thing to see well, on the page. Yeah, when they're, yeah. yes, and there have been marvelous, marvelous artists. I have to tell the audience that, that Morton and I met probably 40 years ago at, in the two years of NBC when he was doing a weekly um, uh, feature yes. called uh, Cartoon Views of the News, yes. and I was the person assigned to... <laughs> kind of guide him through it and uh and so he would come i think once a week with an idea and and draw it on right. on camera and talk about it and 
can we try that again? Can you still do that 40 years later? Well, you lift my arm, yeah. <laughs> twist my arm. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm twisting it. I'm yeah, twisting yeah it. We, could, we could try something like that. All right. What do you got in mind? Well, What's on your mind? It's always, it's, always a good, uh, it's always good to do politics, you know. Oh. Which is a, a and are we in the midst of politics? Well, are we in the midst of politics? So, I are there any people uh, not running for no. uh, the Republican nomination? No, but we don't know. And uh, since I, I can't really project uh, all of that, uh, why don't I just start with something? Uh, all right. Uh, so, why don't you talk amongst yourselves? We're all right? talking amongst ourselves. Well, you're. Uh, I guess this is going to be a, a political. Well, commentary uh, or something to do with politics, which is timely. And this is one of a cartoonist's uh, uh, assets is, I mean, to be timely. Well, it's to get some kind of uh, a thing. It's also, as I'm doing this now, I'm sort of aware of the fact that it's it's sort of seeing the process uh, that that goes on with Mm -hmm. it, but um, which is... The creation of it, you can see it's, I, I guess it's, it's sort of what you were saying before uh, mm-hmm. regarding the um, various things that uh, I did. This is in real time, by the way, right? Yes, we we're doing this in real time. time. I mean, this, so is, we should, uh, this is not slow-mo replay and all that phony stuff they do on those golf well, you, telecasts you where, they tell, where, they, where they let you think it, the shot they, they is make, live, they, but it really isn't. Actually, I think I, I kind of like the idea in a certain way that, that goes on when it's, you know, all in one. But uh, to begin with... But the narrative part of this, you see, you don't know what's happening yet. You may a little bit, you know, but this I'm, is sort of in yeah. my mind. You don't know, really, I think, uh, but you see there's a certain uh, process of creation, which is my going the way th- English language is, which is... Ah, beginning to... Right. And, of course, this is this is a little bit artificial. I mean, you don't have to draw this fast when you're putting... When you're actually I think creating I was, one, I think when I did uh, news of the week, news of the cartoon views of the news, I think we were down to a minute and twenty seconds. I yeah, don't know a minute thirty, I think it was. Well, but I'm beginning okay. to get the sense of uh, somebody. What is that? It looks like a pollster, a political pollster, has come to somebody's door and presumably is asking a question about a candidate or all of the candidates or something. Am I close? You are very close. You're right on, as it would say. So it's also in the process of of the creation of it, which is you're starting out with a subject of something that's going on. Mm -hmm. And what the cartoon then does is there's a reaction to the subject. So you got a subject here, and you can see, yes, there's a poll going on. And you're starting on the left, and you're going on to see what the reaction is. And now you're going to find out. The reaction is, this, here comes the... Well, let me, let me get the, it right, so I don't... Is, is this the, uh, the caption? This is the caption. Okay. We're almost there. Okay. I love this. I love creation in... In, in, in my midst. So you see, now she says, she's asking him, is this yech for all of them, for any one of them, or for all of them? <laughs> yes. What I used to say, and I would sign it, and with cartoon views of the news, <laughs> this is more curve. Okay. I did that. <laughs> you did that. How that's how that's much, marvelous. How much time was that? Was that there, took yeah. about, I don't know, about three minutes, two and a half how minutes. about that? Uh, I was... A bit saddened by uh, something I heard David Remnick say, the editor of The New Yorker, uh, that he wants younger cartoonists. I was, and more, my question, I was, I was more saddened. <laughs> <laughs> I imagined you were. And, and if I had David Remnick sitting there, I would ask him, Mr. Remnick, is uh, our older cartoonists not funny? I mean, is, fun, is, is humor, uh, does it? Ebb with a person's age? What what kind of nonsense is that? What do you expect me to say to that? Well, I'm just obviously I I I agree with it on on a certain, and this is part of that questions that was looked at 
this documentary that's uh, about there's a documentary coming out yeah. coming out and there's a kind of a, on a, HBO a, yeah it's a kind of a lot of uh, very semi-serious and it has a lot it's an intergenerational view so the subject that you raise you know is really you know a kind of part of that documentary as well I think it is true that with each age, there's a redefinition of an aesthetic of what's good or bad or, or it's, it's funny or it's not funny. And there's no way to, uh, you, know, you know, mitigate that. Even in my time with The New Yorker, there were some editors who bought my work, bought mm-hmm. more of my work than less of my work. My work didn't change very much from, uh, you know, one editor to another, except that I think, I think Tina Brown bought more of my work than anybody else. I, and it, it changed with different yeah, people. Yeah. And obviously it's, it's something to do with the current uh, new wave of uh, aesthetics. You, uh, it would okay. be in music we had, as well. We're, we're pretty much out of time, but I did want to mention, and I'm sorry we, we can't get to it and talk about it and show it, but Mort is also, as he was talking about earlier in the program, you do many things. Among them was reportage and uh, for instance Mort at the Democratic Convention the famous convention of 1968 in Chicago did a whole series of uh, uh, reporting Very and drawing and and you know and was and was uh, was gassed and beaten by the police and I wish we had time to talk about that but it's been a delight to visit with you and uh, thank you for coming by today my pleasure Tony anytime all right and we will see you next week